I think God is God. He's always been the same. He always will be. Um, but I think of it as a characteristic of God that is really being profound in my life at the moment is that he's the God of the relationship. But he's primarily the God of relationship. And that the way to worship him isn't by doing lots of stuff for him, but by hanging out with him in relationship. I love it in the Gospel of Luke when Jesus is asked, what's the greatest commandment? And as always, he turns the question around and uh, the guy answers correctly. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. Love your neighbour as yourself. And then Luke tells the story of the Good Samaritan as an answer to how do you love neighbour? But we think that Luke probably put the story of Mary and Martha after as a way to love and worship God. There we have love languages. We have Mary showing her love language of intimacy, of relationship. And we see Martha's love language of doing loads of stuff for God. And I think Jesus then reveals his love language. And Martha says, get my sister to do stuff with me. And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, be like your sister. Just be and hang around me. I think there's a culture of doing stuff for God and the, the most important people in the church are the people who do the most. And I think that those people are wonderful and they should be celebrated. Martha's not a bad person, but I think God just wants to remind us that relationship comes first, that worship of him comes before we do loads of stuff. And I think it is that people are knackered and lots of people have told me um, that they're enjoying the rest. Some people are dreading going back to how it was and all the rotors that they're gonna have to go on to make it happen. People have enjoyed the simplicity of lockdown. But it's not just the tiredness, it's that when you take the doing away, people realize that they might not have a relationship with God, but actually their relationship with God is what they do, not who they are and who he is. And I think God wants to simply strip that away and just be simply present with them, reminding them of his love and that love swaying and helping us to join in with his worship and his mission. That's how we're being called to worship differently. COVID, in a way, has not really changed my opinion on that. Um, my view changed when I started missional listening. And the thing that's come to me really strongly is that God's asking us to come to mission with a different posture. The first way I mean that is to come to God with a different posture and be like those fishermen on the boat who had been fishing all night. And Jesus says, what have you caught? And the fishermen had to embarrassingly say, nothing. My nets, my hands are empty. And then uh, Jesus says, put your nets the other side. And they do, and they have a miraculous catch. And I think Jesus is telling us to come to him with empty hands, say we haven't caught anything. We don't know what to do. We don't know how to do it. And to allow him to teach us, and we'll find that we're in the right place. Uh, we just need to join in with what he's doing rather than get him to bless all of our endeavors. And in the same way as uh, going to God with empty hands, I think God's calling us to go with empty hands to the neighbor. In the same way as Jesus at the well said, can I have some water? I think Jesus wants us to need our neighbor, not as a missional target, but as a missional friend, a missional conversation partner. I think that's why he sends the 72 out with nothing. He needs us to need them, a place to stay, a food to eat. And as we listen and join in and what we hear, we suddenly realize that we have the opportunity to share our story. And I'm still sure that our story of salvation is a story that can transform lives and communities and this world. 
This is Paul in Athens who just hung around and looked around and got to know the culture, looked around all the tombs and found one to an unknown God. And then the invitation came when he could finally preach the good news in a contemporary, relevant way to those people on Mars Hill. It's about waiting for people to say, why is your life different? I wish I had your faith. How do you cope? How do you parent like that? Why are those things important? And then you can answer, then you can share, then you can journey. I often wonder what an evangelist looks like today. Is it still the Billy Graham character who gets up in front of a stadium where people have bought someone and gets them from one place to another? And I'm not sure that that is the new evangelist. I think that the new evangelists are, are spiritual directors, pastors, people who can help people experience God, people who can help people to see God in their lives and um, open themselves up to that and experience the presence of God. They learn to pray and that leads them to a place. So for me, evangelists are people who can help people realize who God is and how they can encounter him. I think I want to say that there's two ways we could come out of this. One is we can go back to how things were, or the second is we could be in for a new normal, the famous words. I go on a beautiful walk all the time in a favorite place of mine called Abbotsbury. I started the cricket pitch, which I used to captain, walk up to St. Catherine's Chapel, where you can see counties, and then I walk down to Chesil Beach. It's glorious. And I did that walk in Lent with a friend, a pioneer, and we were talking about how do we begin a pioneering movement in Dorset, and we had a great time. Then lockdown came, and I wasn't able to walk that walk for a fair while. Then in June, as we were allowed a bit further, I, I took my kids down there to do the walk. And as we were walking, I felt God remind me of that previous walk with the pioneer. And then I felt God say, look a bit closer. And as I looked at the hedgerows and the wildlife and the flowers, and I realized that what was an always beautiful walk was even more beautiful now. And it had a wild beauty to it. And there were plants there I'd never seen before. It was buzzing with creatures I hadn't seen there before. And the creatures seemed more numerous. And I felt God remind me that the church was dormant at the top of the hill. This I think is a sense of rewilding that if we just leave creation to itself, it grows and old things start to happen again. We've seen it during COVID, fish being seen in Venice, birds heard in Wuhan, turtles laying eggs in front of five-star hotels in Mexico. We've taken our hands off creation and what was always beautiful has now got a wild beauty. And I think God's challenging us and particularly leaders to take our hands off of the church to let go of control and allow God to be God and to work through his church. I think his calling to leaders at the moment is just to help people encounter his presence and then to allow what he's doing in those people just to bubble up to beauty. And I think the church that's always been beautiful could have a wild beauty to it. And I think if I'm honest, the over church is beautiful I think it could be described post pre-COVID as tame. How might we become wild again? And if we take our hands off, maybe God's Holy Spirit will come back to us and the things we read in Acts or going on in Africa might be our stories of healing and new life and communities being planted. It might be once again the good news to the poor. And instead of our buildings being filled with middle-class Christians, we might see everybody start to want to be a part of radical community. What does it look to rewild the church? How can we take our hands off and allow God to do what God does? that it actually was a movement, that it actually felt like a movement, that we actually, when we said Baptist family, it felt like a family. I think for those two words to be owned and lived out would be great. 
I think what I also want to say, and I'm going to out myself as, mu as well as other people here, is that I hear Baptists not speak well of other Baptists. Um, I've heard at colleges people slagging off regional ministers or, or, um, or the union itself. I've heard regional ministers criticising colleges or the union itself. I've heard the conservative evangelical church slagging off the liberal down the road church, the charismatic, the not. And my feeling is, is that we're never going to grow whilst we're living in that way. And I just want to own that and repent myself for the times that I've done that. I think God is calling us as a Baptist union to answer Lynn's prophetic request that we'd be one team or that we'd be one, like Father, Son and Spirit are one. That pioneering and inherited conservative and liberal can journey together with their own truths, but learn from one another and become something even more beautiful. And when we live in unity, Psalm 133, but oil will pour down like Aaron's hair and beard and shoulders. What does oil mean? The presence of God. That when we're in unity, when we are one team, we will be filled with the presence of God. And people will come to faith, not because of what we do, but because of who we are and how we relate to one another. So the future is, I pray, that we really will be a Baptist family. We really will be a Baptist movement and that we'll talk well of each other, love one another, grow with one another. And because of that way, we'll be anointed with the oil, the presence of God, and people will not be able to not but fall in love with Jesus with Baptists around him.